The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the X-Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide, toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. Email X-Zone at X-Zoneradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, TV at Hotmail.com. And our website, www.XZoneRadioTV.com. My guest this hour, speaking about a midnight train to Georgia is Tobias McGriff, and we're going to be talking to Tobias about his new book, Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour, and his website is www.blueorbtours.com. And now joining me from the beautiful state of Georgia is our guest this hour, Tobias McGriff, and Tobias, welcome to the X-Zone. Thanks so much, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here. Great talking with you, too. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you developed the interest in the paranormal. It's actually started at a very early age. I had the good fortune. Uh, my family was friends with a southern ghost writer named Catherine Tucker Wyndham, uh, who did about 29 books on the South, Southern Ghost Stories, and actually was on NPR and all the way up until she passed away at, at 93 wow. last year. And, and so I started off early listening to these amazing ghost stories from her, and then years later uh, in the library at the, at the high school that I went to, I, I read through her books, and I realized that these stories that I had been hearing in her home during the summer, mm-hmm. she actually had been testing them on me before she put them in the book when wow. I was just 10, 10 12 years old. Now, now tell, so me, was, tell me, I'm Tobias, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, have you yourself ever seen a ghost? I have. I, I have to believe that I have. You know, ghosts... You know, ghost is a general term, but mm-hmm. I, certainly I've seen anomalies that are unexplainable, um, and some of them bodily apparitions. So yes, I would say definitely. In your opinion, after studying the world of the paranormal all these years and being so involved in it, what do you think a ghost is? I I have several different theories, and, and I have to admit there's one part of me that the deeper I go into this, mm-hmm. the more questions that I have, but I think in a blush... Uh, I, I agree with the general consensus that there seems to be a, a residual uh, haunting and, and also an intelligent haunting, uh, which is to say I think that you know, sometimes if we're dealing or talking about you know, the Akashic Record, I think, I think there is this loop. Uh, an event can be so you know, not necessarily tra- mm-hmm. tragic, but um, memorable might be the right word, yeah. uh, that we in the collective are able to pick that up as a residual. But then also I believe that there are, you know, entities out there, for whatever reason, uh, have not, will not cross over. And uh, I, I will even go so far as to say I believe that some of them uh, have been human, and others I, I tend to believe have never been human. Tobias, stand by. You and I have to take a commercial break. We'll be back in two minutes. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Tobias McGriff. He is the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. And, uh, you know, Tobias is the voice of all things strange in America's most haunted city. Tobias is the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour, based on his experiences with the paranormal in Savannah, Georgia. Tobias is also the founder of Blue Orb Ghost Tours, named Savannah's Best Ghost Tour by the Destination Guide in both 2011 and 2012. This hour, my guest, the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour, Tobias McGriff. We'll both be back on the other side of this commercial break in two minutes. And for more information, here is his website, www.blueorbtours.com. 
Zone.com. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the X Zone, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern on the Talkstar Radio Network, X Zone Broadcast Network, UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, and our broadcast affiliates right around the world. We'll be back in two. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Welcome back, everyone. When the lights go out in Georgia, that's when things start in Savannah. Our guest this hour is the author of a fascinating book entitled Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. And he's also the gentleman behind the Blue Orb Tours, his website, www.blueorbtours.com. And of course, I'm talking about my guest this hour, Tobias McGriff. Tobias, how haunted is Savannah? Well, according to the American Institute of Parapsychology, it's the most haunted city in America. Wow. And I would have to say the, the longer I stay there, the, the more I agree. Uh, we actually had a chance to start Blue Orb in a lot of other cities, and we chose Savannah because every time you know we came mm-hmm. to the city, uh, it never failed, uh, it never let us down. It always produced every time we came. During during the writing of your book Savannah Shadows, what was the 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 chapter that really intrigued you most? I, I by the way, I've gone through the book, fascinating book. It's a great read. I love the pictures. So so what? was your key chapter as the author? I would have to say for me, it would be uh, Voodoo Nation. I actually have two, if, okay. if you will allow yeah, me. Yeah, sure. Um, I would have to say two. Voodoo Nation would have to be one, mm-hmm. and, and and then also, uh, and then she melted, uh, simply because, you know, and then that's that's the story that has so impacted me. It's my own personal experience, and I thought that it was a good idea uh, before I lay bare the stories of others, I thought it was a good idea to share my own experience and kind of subject myself to the scrutiny. And then Voodoo Nation, because uh, I had a chance to get mm-hmm. to know a culture that I had been familiar with, but so many misconceptions that I had. And to be, get, be given that level of access by the Voodoo community that's just north of Savannah, uh, I was able to clear up so many things and, and learn so many different things. Uh, and also lose a lot of the fear and apprehension that I think I had uh, for the culture. There's still all the mystery and intrigue mm-hmm. and, and the magic that you would imagine that there is, uh, but it's it's far less scary and, and much more mystical and amazing, uh, I think, after, after writing the book. Would you do us a great favor and, and tell us the story that I would imagine we could say inspired the writing of this book, the very, the very experience that you had? Sure, yeah. We, uh, when I was coming to Savannah uh, in January of 2005, I was there with a film crew, and we were there to do some cursory interviews. It was uh, for submission to some reality television programming. And one of the folks that I had with me who has a very distinct style of, uh, of dress, uh, she's a, a clothes horse, I believe is the right uh, term you would use, um, she had on, on this very distinctive baby blue like a bowler and a matching scarf. Mm-hmm. And we pull into Savannah on this just you know barren, desolate you know January. And we were fortunate enough to be able to get you know parking down on uh, Bay Street, which is typically very hard, but because of the off season, it wasn't. We parked the vehicle, and as we're unloading the cameras, she discovers or sees these sees tunnels that have bars over them. And you know, being an explorer, she decides she's going to go down there. Well, she's only about 5'3", maybe weighs 105 pounds, and so she can slip through the bars. And I discouraged her from doing it, but she, you know, she's her own person. 
Well, I start canvassing the area and doing some interviews myself, and the shop owners were, you know, they were willing to talk to us because of the, because of the off season. Sure. And as I'm coming back, I see her going in through the bars, and I decide that I'm going to sit down on on a bench uh, uh-huh. facing Bay Street, and I'm going to wait for her. And I'm looking through a free map of the city that uh, has been provided to me by one of the shop owners. And as I'm doing this, less than two minutes later, uh, there's this large live oak behind me. And I see what is, you know, out of the corner of my eye against, you know, this dead backdrop of a wintry savanna, I see this baby blue scarf and bowler. And I ask her how things went, and I don't get a response. And I turn to look at her, and she has extended the top half of, of her, well, her torso and her head from the tree. And she's looking at me almost sideways, and she has a smile on her face. But I'll never forget the smile because it was, in the book, I call it a forgery Mm -hmm. because it was something that was attempting to approximate a smile, something that had never known smile muscles, I guess would be the best way to say it. And there was just this horrific look behind the eyes, and I knew this was not the person that it was uh, attempting to convince me that it was. And I was speechless. Mm -hmm. And as it began to lose, I call it, lose the ability to hold its form, I watch it almost start to literally melt. And as it does, it slinks behind the tree. And I'm obviously completely subjected to my experience. And I would say, you lose time in situations like that. But I would say within seconds, I look to that tunnel and I see her exiting it, which is about 150 yards away from me. And by the time she gets to me, I've you know, tried to compose myself, which obviously something is wrong with me. And it would, it would take a year before I would realize that what I had actually met that day uh, is what's commonly referred to as the shapeshifter uh, or the hag in mm-hmm. the low country. Unbelievable. Why do you think it's only some people that have the ability to see these entities from what we classify the, the beyond I think I think it's an openness. You know, I I, I even mentioned the term earlier, Akashic Record. I, mm-hmm. I think there is this non-physical library of, of data that we all have access to, but uh, it's a little contrived, but I think it's fitting that in this library, you know, everybody has access to get the card, just not everybody uses it. And and there's things that, you know, can get in the way. Uh, we can, you know, focus. We We have a certain amount of vital capacity. And some people choose to use their vital capacity to open these channels, and other people are very concerned with day-to-day life and activities. And with with me, I know that um, you know after years of doing this, uh, over a decade, uh, brushes with the paranormal for me are very rare. Uh, they're not common events, and so I also think because of the rarity of them and and the price you kind of have to pay to to get to see them. It usually doesn't surprise me when I meet someone who's 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and they tell me, you know, almost daily, uh, I've never had a paranormal experience, but I would like to. So I think it's a matter of access. I think it's a choosing. I'm a firm believer that uh, the universe will guard our right to do most anything we want to or see most anything we want to, uh, but we do have a limited number of things that we can pursue just, just from a matter of time. 1-800-610-7035, one 800 610 worldwide toll free. My name is Rob McConnell. My guest this hour is Tobias McGriff. He's the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. Are zombies real, Tobias? I think definitely so. Uh, you know, we, we read about you know, certain varieties of zombie, and, mm-hmm. you know, the serpent and the rainbow, and yeah. uh, also... Uh, William Seabrook wrote a book uh, called The Magic Island in 1929 that kind of established, I, I guess, the Western mindset for what we consider a zombie. Um, but basically, you know, in, in the conjuring community, uh, the, the hoodoo and voodoo communities, uh, they believe in a spiritual and a physical zombie, uh, which is basically just the undead. And they can come to you in a physical or a spiritual form. And so we even... We even call one of the tours, you know, the zombie tour. And what we're really doing is we're using, is we're saying a ghost tour, but we're using the hoodoo or voodoo word for it. 
So it's really just the undead animated, I guess, is the best way to describe it. So, yes, I would say definitely. Before we went to the uh, first break, you were telling us how you actually went into the voodoo community and, and, uh, you know, did some research. And you found that you really had nothing to fear, or that's the impression that I received. Why do people think or believe that there's so much mysticism and that they actually have to fear voodoo? I think mainly because of, of popular media. Mm. Uh, I think we've sensationalized it because it, it makes for good ratings. And on the other side of that, I, I do think that there are things to fear. I just think we're fearing the wrong things. Uh, mostly when I talk to someone about going to the Voodoo Village north of Savannah, they're afraid that perhaps they're, they're not going to let them leave or they're going to you know, kidnap them for some sort of you know, ritual or sacrifice. And, and that's not the thing to fear. The thing to fear is going into a very spiritual place, a very spiritually active place, uh, a place where there is a certain standard uh, that is expected for, for, from everyone there. And everyone plays a part in the spiritual process. And I do believe that some entities are negative in nature. And someone that goes there, you know, half-cocked, if you will, uh, there are things to fear, but not from the people themselves. Uh, I think you could go there and open yourself up to some really bad things uh, just because of the sheer amount of traffic. Sure. Uh, they, they go through, you know, the spirituality of, of their belief system is constant. And so from, from the, the blessing of food, uh, when they talk about engaging in animal sacrifice, mm. When you say that at a, at a first blush, blush, it sounds horrific. Yeah. But in reality, what they do, in, in my opinion, is far more respectful than how we treat some of the food that we consume, uh, you know, slaughtering it in you know, mass. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% there. It's just like uh, the, the, uh, the native North Americans. They only killed what they were going to eat, and they did it with a reverence for the animal. Sure. Yeah. They believe that they would become a part of it, and it's the same here. Nothing goes to waste. I mean, they they do they do end the life of the food source ritualistically, uh, mm-hmm. but it's only because they intend to, as they consume the essence, they believe it aids them spiritually. And, you know, we tend to have a very utilitarian viewpoint when it comes to food. Uh, so in, in, in one respect, I think it's it's far more humane and respectful than the way we treat it. But when you just say, yes, they, they do at practice animal sacrifice, mm-hmm. that is true. Willful possession is another example. Um, everything in, in most Western belief systems says that possession is of the devil. It's bad. It's to be feared. It's to be avoided. And if it happens, it's almost always involuntarily, and it's usually met with an exorcism. Yeah, stand by, Tobias. We've got to take a commercial break, but we can just say the same thing about uh, any other religious philosophy. When you're asking your deity for protection, that in itself is some sort of possession as well. You and I will be back on the other side of this news break. Exonation Nation, Tobias McGriff is our special guest. He's the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. Website, www.blueorbtours.com. We'll be back on the other side of this news break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. 
Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, Tobias McGriff is our special guest. He's the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. He's got a great website, www.blueorbtours.com. In your book, you talk about secret cemeteries. What's that all about? Well, one in particular comes to mind. Um, When Savannah was first founded, it was a military colony, which meant that everything was very tight and concentric, you know, because if you got invaded, obviously you didn't want to have easy access. Uh, um, But we're also a port city, so we had many more people, you know, coming here than ever intended to stay. And if you can, you know, you can do the math, you know, long-term ocean voyage circa 1730, these folks are arriving, um, sometimes, you know, half the folks sick, dying, or dead. Well, they never made it any further than Savannah. And their family members would move on to settle what would become, obviously, you know, the, the United States of America. But they would leave these folks behind in these unmarked graves. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were lost to history. They were lost to, the, you know, the growing of the, you know, the pine trees and the live oaks in Savannah. Uh, and then we have these other cemeteries, for example, during the time of yellow fever. We've been hit innumerable times by that epidemic, but probably ten times in a very horrific way. And one one epidemic in particular resulted in there being a mandate in Savannah that the burials had to be carried out at night um, in secret to keep the population from knowing how bad the epidemic really was. Huh. And, and so what you have going on, one out of six people would ultimately, you know, succumb to this epidemic. Mm -hmm. And the hospital staff, as they would load these bodies into the backs of wagons, they would go out into the countryside along these, you know, dark, dimly lit dirt roads, and they would look for your family members. And if they were unavailable or if they had moved, they would bring you back around the old Candler Hospital area, uh, which is Georgia's first hospital. And they resorted to actually burying people um, in an illegal, unmarked cemetery. And we know it was illegal because there's never been a charter for a cemetery that far south. And it would not be until Eli Whitney actually announced you know, the patent and the, and the invention of the cotton gin from Savannah uh, that we began to expand. We had this, you know, moguls and fortune seekers were coming to Savannah. And as they began to expand out, we started discovering all of these cemeteries that we didn't know existed. And even to this day, we still refer to that, those populations of people, even in our writings, uh, as strangers. And they continue to be uncovered. Let me ask you this question, if you don't mind, uh, Tobias. Sure. Why do you think the paranormal is gaining so much speed and, and public awareness? I'm a huge fan of Terrence McKenna's work. Oh, yeah. And he talked about, I had a chance to interview his brother, Dennis, um, and he had some some really good insight. You know, Terrence used to call uh, God the transcendental object waiting for all of us at the end of time. But wasn't Terrence? Was, but wasn't I thought Ter- it was a really great definition. Yeah, of but God. What, wasn't Terrence also heavily involved with drugs, psychotropic drugs? Sure. Yeah, he was. He he was an advocate of of dimethyltryptamine. Sure. Uh, he was a, he was an advocate of mushrooms. Um, so, but you know, in between in between that, he had some great insights. You know, he was a, he was a thinker for sure. Um, and in my opinion, an, edu- an, ed- an educated guy. And, uh, you know, Dennis continues to espouse a lot of the philosophies of Terrence. And, yeah. you know, and, he, and he's working at some studies of how to use those types of things medicinally uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a reverent way, I guess, and also medicinal way. But do you, do you really think the, the use of mind-altering drugs or mind-altering substances is actually necessary in order to understand the paranormal or the... Of the um, the New Age philosophies? No, absolutely not. Um, but I, but I do think the definition that Terence coined was a good one, and I and I think the interest in the paranormal continues to grow because you know this thing waiting for us at the end of time. I think there's this you know this exponential gain in knowledge. You know where where we're making strides in a year that that rival what we had done in a thousand years mm-hmm. at this point. I think that well, there's just there's this belief or this feeling inside of all of us that we're moving towards not necessarily the end of time, but a transition. Some may call it the end of the world. Some may call it the tribulation. 
Uh, of course, we have 2012 hanging over our heads. I, I don't believe the world is going to end. Uh, in neither 2012. do I. Neither do I. Um, but it's just one more thing uh, in, a, in a larger fire that I think contributes to this, this feeling in all of us because we live in this information age. We've, we've come so far so fast. People are constantly wondering there can't be a whole lot left unless it results in some sort mm. of uh, brush with an interdimensional thing. I mean, we, we, I think there's this expectation that we've come far enough, fast enough, that the next thing that's going to happen is there's either going to be a ship landing in Washington uh, or there's going to be a, a disembodied you know, ascended entity that's going to, you know, meet me at my next meditation session. I think every belief system that you look at, uh, every religion right now, uh, even if it's not organized, there seems to be just this running theme through everyone's mind that we're on the, we're on the verge of a breakthrough. But what and that would certainly be the last frontier, I, w- I would think. I think that's why parapsychology continues to be one of the slower moving disciplines to gain any sort of credibility because we're asking the hardest questions. You know, we're asking, you know, the who and the why questions. But I but I and, think parapsychology is also asking questions to which they hope there are no answers because as long as the answer is not available to parapsychology, it exists. When the answers are then discovered, it ceases to be a mystery and you don't need parapsychology anymore. It's just like the U- it's just like the UFO genre. My belief is that it's not the government that's maintaining a conspiracy. It's not the the church that's maintaining the conspiracy. I believe it's the UFO community itself that's maintaining a UFO conspiracy. Because as long as the conspiracy is in place, they really don't have to show any evidence for their beliefs. Sure, and you well, and you also have a large amount of charlatans um, big in time. the discipline. Big time, okay. big time. Because you know, because what we do, you know, but is largely speculation. Mm-hmm. And then, if we do ever come to a proving point, it gets handed off to a different discipline of science. Um, and I do think there's it's one of the reasons why I have so much uh, hesitation towards reality paranormal programming because there's this pressure to produce results, you know, every week. Yep. Um, I find it fantastic that that a, that a group of folks would be able to find something, you know, otherworldly on a on a time schedule. Um, but you and I, but you and I both know, being in this industry for as many years as we have, that that isn't how it plays out in reality. And and I, you know, I find that the biggest oxymoron is is reality TV, because if mm-hmm. you have reality TV, you don't have the sponsors. So in order to get the sponsors and the ratings, you mm-hmm. lie through your teeth. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's full of it, and yeah. it's one of those things where it, it's so unnecessary. Because there are so many things that, in my opinion, just because we can explain them, mm-hmm. they don't cease to be amazing. That's true. And 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 so we don't we don't have to fear new discovery. And and I and I think there's always going to be something that's above normal. Sure. Uh, we'll establish new norms for what normal is. Mm-hmm. Uh, things that we do now would be fantastic to someone beyond comprehension to someone that lived 200 years ago. Um, and and we and that and we'll continue to gain explanations for the things that we that we find. I just think at some point, uh, you know, we can measure words now. There, there's a way to tell that they have you know um, shape, form, mass. And 20 years ago, we couldn't do that. That's right. And so I I think a lot of these mysteries are coming to a head. And I think that's a good thing. I don't I don't think we should worry that we're going to run out of mysteries. You're probably you probably remember. Uh, rem- I, I I don't remember what year it was, but. Uh, someone made the comment that now has been used as a meme, where all the patents that could be filed had now be fi- had, had been filed. There's there's no way we're going to come up with anything new. And yeah. this, this was done like over a hundred years ago. I know people sometimes do not have the vision that they need. People, human beings, at times can very can be very close minded, and mm-hmm. I, I agree with you that mysteries that are solved create many times more the value of the originally of the original mystery that's been solved sure yeah there's yeah. no there's no need to manufacture there's 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 a, an eternal i think basin of things that are that are continue that are going to continue yep. to astonish us uh and the way that we get to the true astonishment the way that we get to the real uh is to ask the real questions and if it's not there it's not there I, you know, uh, again, going, and I don't mean to bash reality, you know, paranormal programming. Oh, why um, not? I've done it many times. 
go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll, you know, I've got my own opinion, and, and, and but it's one of those things where, you know, there's no need to to embellish. It's just mm-hmm. the same way with with telling ghost stories in Savannah. Yeah, you would be well. You probably wouldn't be amazed, but some people would be amazed at some of the stories that get passed around. Uh, one home in particular, you know, there was a news article in 1947 that said there had been um, a possible multiple homicide at a house on this particular street that this house resides on. That has now grown into three girls were murdered there <laughs> and, and disemboweled in the living room in a ritualistic sacrifice. I mean, that's, that's what happens, and, but we don't have to do that. There's enough creepy tales and ghostly encounters yeah. and, uh, to keep us busy forever. We don't have to embellish. We just have to be willing to do the work to, find, you know, to get to the truth. Listen, I understand that, uh, that you have the opportunity of speaking to Christopher Lutz uh, from the Amityville uh, situation. Uh, what is your take on the Amityville horror? Was it just a real estate deal that went bad, or was there, in fact, paranormal activity going on? Well, I think it's been largely, you know, proven that the Amityville story was large parts of it were a hoax. Mm-hmm. And Christopher Lutz, to his credit, he you know he was a child yeah. in that house for 28 days while they lived there, and to his credit, he has been um, a pioneer of trying to stop Hollywood from remaking the, this thing uh, into this you know ever evolving story that gets more and more you know bombastic every yeah. time it's told, and. You know, Christopher's position is this, and I, and I tend to agree, and I think it, we have to defer to him because he seems to be the most level-headed one out of the group. Uh, he says that there were some legitimate things going on at Amityville, right? but it wasn't as a result of the killings that took place there. The family, I believe there were six people that were actually killed. He tends to believe that it was at the hands of his stepfather, who was doing things, transcendental meditation is what Christopher calls it, uh, in an attempt to actually conjure these things up. Christopher says that he continues to be plagued by these things that his, that his stepfather exposed him to long after they left Amityville. Um, and, and his stepfather, according to Christopher, my, my feeling is that Christopher seem, seems to feel, and I don't mean to speak for him, mm-hmm. seems to feel, uh, that his stepfather had some financial motivations for either having something really happening, happening and documenting it that way, uh, or as the popular story has gone now, that uh, it was concocted as a real estate scheme. You and I have to take our final break for this hour, Tobias, but before we go, um, when you've been on any of your many tours that you've conducted, has to your knowledge, anyone ever been physically attacked by an unseen entity? Physically attacked? No. Um, physically touched? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and physically attacked post-tour? Yes. Interesting. I don't mean to be difficult. I was just yep. trying to be specific. All right, stand by, young man. You and I have to take our news break. Exo Nation, Tobias McGriff is my special guest this hour. He's the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. His website is www.blueorbtours.com. And Tobias is a professional member of the Rhine Research Center and has helped to create afterlife research technology with engineers from Georgia Tech and Atlanta and Atlanta based MIT graduates. He is widely regarded as an expert on supernatural phenomena and the haunted history of the southern United States. Once again, the name of his book, Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour, and his website is www.blueorbtours.com. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. By the way, Exo Nation, the X Chronicles newspaper comes out this coming weekend. And, of course, we will be sending all our list members around the world their online edition. And if anyone else would like to get a copy of the X Chronicles newspaper, all you have to do is just send me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. 
1-800-610-7035, worldwide toll-free email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com, and our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. Oh, that's right. That's uh, Ray Charles singing George on My Mind, a classic. And what a fitting song to be played uh, during this hour, joining us from the state of Georgia is Tobias McGriff. He's the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. His website is www.blueorbtours.com. First of all, Tobias, I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's been a delightful hour speaking with you, and thank you for sharing the, the fascinating history, both normal and paranormal, of Savannah, Georgia. So thank you very much. It's uh, been super. But I, there is something I'd like to ask you. On the back of your book, uh, the um, it reads... Savannah's history is not just that of a port city. It is also one of a portal city. How do you explain that? I think the, the best way to explain it is that because of the amount of, of tragedy, the amount of history, uh, the way that we've uh, chosen to deal with our tragedy, mm-hmm. uh, deal with our dead, uh, there continue, continues to be uh, a wide number of people that come to Savannah for paranormal investigations, ghost tours, uh, we've, you know, that collective has been referred to as a walking Ouija board. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the popular theory is that, you know, if you, if you engage in, a, a, I guess, a form of social conjuring long enough and have the right conditions, eventually it can open up a, a person, place, or thing uh, to traffic, you know, from other dimensions. And I would say that Savannah is kind of that perfect storm uh, of all of those things. And, and I think and over time, Uh, It has created, I think, uh, a well-deserved title of America's Most Haunted City. Quickly, give us some information on Blue Orb Tours. Blue Orb Tours, uh, we run several different tours. Uh, We have the City of the Dead. Uh, We run the Uncensored Zombie Tour. Uh, We also run special tours. We do guided investigations into some very uh, historical uh, buildings uh, with a very reputable haunted history. Uh, we show people how to do, you know, ethical, uh, low-impact uh, paranormal investigations and also how to properly use equipment, mm-hmm. uh, what the readings mean, if you will. Um, and we also do uh, cemetery tours to Bonaventure Cemetery that are not paranormal but historical in nature so that we also give you some, some background on the non-spooky side of Savannah. You know what I love about the paranormal? It keeps history alive. It really does, in a great way. That's right. Uh, Your book, Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour, where is it available? It is available. uh, The website, as you mentioned, if they go there, they will have the opportunity to order it from a direct link that goes to Amazon and Kindle Mm -hmm. and paperback form. Uh, Should they choose to want a uh, hardcover signed edition, uh, that can be ordered simply by calling our ticketing office, and we will mail that out with free shipping. Excellent. Tobias, I want to thank you once again so much for joining us. Continued success. Keep the great work up. And when's the next book coming out? Uh, The next book tentatively is going to be called Supernatural Science, and it should be available by the middle of next year. And we're going to take a look at how, uh, how people search for truth. We're going to look at the science behind what folks are using. My kind of book. My kind of author. Thank you very much, Tobias. Take care of yourself. Continued success. Exxon Nation, Tobias McGriff has been my guest this hour. He's the author of Savannah Shadows, Tales from the Midnight Zombie Tour. It's available online uh, at Amazon.com. Go to his website, www.blueorbtours.com. And uh, we'll be having Tobias back in the near future. We won't wait a whole year to get him back, but we will have him back when his new book comes out for sure. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the X Zone. We'll be back at six and a half minutes past the hour. Don't go away.